At the dawn of the 1940s, some Americans suspected that the war raging in Europe would eventually pull the U.S. into the fight, but most saw the conflict as far away and felt secure that they would be safe. However, the Japanese attack on the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, changes things. The attack thrust the nation into a global war that it had barely prepared for. The fight required a rapid mobilization of all aspects of American society, drawing all citizens into the war effort by demanding a degree of sacrifice by everyone. To this end, the federal government under Franklin Delano Roosevelt assumed tighter control of the economy and directed energies of industry toward producing goods and material for the war effort. The workforce was transformed as women took over traditionally male occupations while businesses chafed under new regulations and price controls. Household staples became scarce as resources were diverted. Intense propaganda campaigns made Americans feel as if they were practically every move they made either helped or hurt the war effort. Americans, meanwhile, tried to live their lives as normally as possible. Some could not. Misguided fears of espionage and sabotage resulted in the forced removal and internment of Japanese-American citizens in large numbers. African-Americans wanting to serve their country or work in the war effort industry faced racial discrimination but proved their worth to the war effort, as did other minorities. America lost FDR not long before the war came to a close, leaving his successor to deal the final blow against the Axis powers. In many, the joy and relief of a hard-fought victory mingled with feelings of uncertainty about what would happen when the soldiers and sailors and Marines came home to a country that had changed greatly in their absence. Mindful of popular opinion as well as congressional investigations into the entry uh, into World War I, the U.S. proclaimed itself officially neutral as the European war began in 1939. After rapid Nazi victories in Poland and France, however, FDR decided that the U.S. could not sit idly by. Congress passed a series of neutrality acts in the late 1930s to keep the U.S. out of the costly war and destructive entanglements such as World War I. FDR agreed to revise the acts to allow belligerents to purchase weapons and non-military goods on a cash and carry basis. That is, having a nation pay the entire bill now and arrange for all transport of goods. In addition, he requested significant budget increases for the military and stepped up airplane production. As the situation in Europe deteriorated, FDR for an ran for an unprecedented third term as president. He defeated internationalist Republican Wendell Wilkie in 1940, promising voters that your boys are not going to be sent into any foreign wars. However, by Christmas of 1940, he stated in a fireside chat that the U.S. must become the great arsenal of democracy. In January, FDR proposed the Lend-Lease Act, which allowed the U.S. to lend or lease weapons to Britain to be paid for after the war. This effectively skirted the cash and carry provisions of the neutrality acts. Though the U.S. had not officially declared war against Germany, it had certainly become involved in the fight. Meanwhile, the U.S. looked for a peaceful way to stop Japanese aggression against China in the Pacific. In an effort to derail Japanese war machine, the FDR decided to embargo sales of needed military goods, such as oil and scrap metal. The embargo convinced some Japanese leaders to best handle any threat by the U.S. militaries was a stunning attack against military inst installations, such as the base at Pearl Harbor. So the U.S. role in Europe, the Lend-Lease Act, cash and carry, we would sell or lend arms to nations that it considered vital to democracy and our own trade. We formed an alliance in the form of the Atlantic Charter, um, which upheld free trade between nations and the right to choose their own government. G German U-boats again began attacking U.S. ships, and the U.S was involved in an undeclared naval warfare with Germany. So here's the electoral map where FDR wins again by a landslide um, for an unprecedented third term defeating Wilkie. Both candidates were considered internationalists, meaning not isolationists. Many Americans did not wish to risk involvement in the war in Europe, regardless of the threat of that Adolf Hitler appeared to pose to world security and stability. Some became vocal in their opposition to increasing American involvement, most notably the America First Committee. Founded in September of 1940, the AFC rose to more than 800,000 members across the nation and included Robert E. Wood, chairman of Sears, Roebuck & Company, World War I flying ace Eddie Rickenbacker, and New Deal agitators Father Charles Coughlin, Conklin and Gerald L. K. Smith. However, the most famous member was probably aviator Charles Lindbergh, 
whose 1927 solo flight had made him a national hero. He believed that the U.S. should focus on building up its air and coastal defenses, asserting that what FDR was asking the American people to enter into and support were actually Europe's problems, and decrying the fact that voters never had an opportunity to vote for these policies. For nearly a year, the America First Committee spoke out against American involvement in the war in Europe. However, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor um, silenced the organization, and it dissolved a less than a week after Pearl Harbor. Perhaps no one made a better case for American internationalism in the days before the U.S. entered the war than Roosevelt himself in his famous War Freedom speech. FDR, recently elected to an unprecedented third term, wanted to impress on the American people, many of whom still oppose U.S. involvement in a widening war in Europe, that aid to Britain, now standing alone against Germany, was not only ensuring their security, but protecting basic freedoms everywhere. This was part of his 1941 State of the Union address, and it equated um, protecting Britain with protecting democracy. So here are some of the texts from his Four spe Freedom speech. We will seek to make secure. We will look forward to a world founded upon our four essential human freedoms, speech and expression, freedom to worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. In 1940, President Roosevelt had promised voters that your young boys aren't going to be sent into any foreign wars. However, he also recognized the need for bolstering the armed services in the case the U.S. did enter war. To that end, Congress passed the Selective Service and Training Act of 1940, commonly called the Selective Service Act, instituting the country's first peacetime draft. The law required that all males between the ages of 21 and 35 register for the draft. A lottery system would then help to select draftees for duty. If selected, the act required a man to serve for 12 months, after which he would be discharged. All service had to occur on the mainland in the U.S. or a U.S. possession. The act limited the peacetime army to approximately 900,000 men. It also allowed for non-combat duty for conscientious objectors. By summer of 1941, it had become increasingly apparent that the U.S. would enter the war. By a single vote, Congress extended the terms of the act from 12 to 18 months. Congress passed a new Selective Service Act soon after the U.S. joined the war, which required all men ages 18 to 65 to register and all men between ages 18 and 85, 45 eligible for military service. This new act lengthened the term of service to six months after the end of the war, and from 1940 to 1947, when the wartime draft expired, more than 10 million Americans were inducted into the service. American hopes of staying out of the war ended on December 7, 1941, when a carrier-based Japanese planes bombed the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. In the attack, more than 2,400 Americans were killed, with over 1,100 wounded. Several American battleships were either sunk or badly damaged. The USS Arizona was destroyed by an armor-piercing bomb that detonated in the ship's fuel and ammunition chain. More than 1,100 sailors and Marines died on board that ship. Other Japanese planes heavily damaged Pearl Harbor's Army installations and airfields. American naval and air power eventually recovered from the attack, but on that day, it was far from certain whether the U.S. military could adequately respond to the Japanese threat and it pretty much crippled the Pacific Fleet. The Japanese designed their attack on Pearl Harbor to be a knockout blow. Members of the Japanese High Command felt that if they could deliver a crippling blow to the Pacific Fleet, the U.S. would not have the heart to prolong for a prolonged war. However, the Japanese underestimated both the U.S. ability to make war and its economic capability. In order to avoid detection, the Japanese fleet used a difficult northern rather than eastern route to approach Pearl Harbor. Many U.S. military officials, however, thought the Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor was impossible, due first to distance from Japan to Hawaii, and second because the relatively shallow harbor would make torpedoes launched from planes simply impact harmlessly on the harbor floor. Most believed that the Japanese had planned a sneak attack on a Sunday to catch the American military forces off guard. In actuality, the Japanese plan did not call for an attack first and its declaration of hostilities later. Translation of the diplomatic cable to the U.S. was delayed, and by the time the Japanese ambassador could deliver the cable, it had already begun. It was not meant to be a sneak attack. People were asleep. It was very early in the morning. The day after the attack on, Pre on Pearl Harbor, President Roosevelt addressed a joint session of Congress and asked for a declaration of war against Japan. 
He opened his speech with the famous words, Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. FDR also described the attack as dastardly and unprovoked. The Senate voted unanimously to declare war on Japan. Only one member of the House of Representatives, Jeanette Rankin of Mont Montana, voted against the resolution. Rankin became the only member of Congress to vote against U.S. entry into both World War I and World War II. FDR did not ask Congress to declare war against Germany. However, both Germany and Italy declared war on the U.S. on December 11th. America now found itself fighting a two-front war. FDR made revisions to this type copy of his speech, including an updated information about the military situation and, more importantly, a one-word change in the opening line. Rather than his original phrasing that the December 7th would be a date which would live in world history, he substituted the word infamy in order to give the statement more impact. After FDR delivered his war message, he inadvertently left the reading copy behind. The Senate clerk found the speech and filed it away in the Senate records where it sat for 43 years. In 1984, an archivist found the speech and placed it in the National Archives. In June of 1942, authorities captured four German agents apparently delivered to the U.S. shore by submarines. Soon after, they were landed at Amagasset, Long Island. A few days later, authorities snapped up four more agents near Jacksonville, Florida. In both instances, the agents carried explosives, maps, and several thousand dollars in cash. According to the FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, the agents had landed with the goal of a two-year campaign to sabotage against the U.S. war industries, railroads, waterworks, and bridges. The Long Island case, Coast Guard personnel observed the initial landing, but lacked equipment to deal with the landing. And instead, um, they notified the FBI, which conducted surveillance in the area and eventually found and arrested the enemy agents. The Coast Guard and the FBI criticized each other for the handling of the situation, and as a result, shore patrols and surveillance were increased for the duration of the war. U-boats in the Western Atlantic. German submarines, U-boats, patrolling off the east coast of the U.S. in the days after Pearl Harbor found the coastline essentially unguarded. In addition, most shipping in the region traveled with lights on and unescorted, easy prey for German U-boats. The German Navy instituted Operation Dr Drumbeat, in which the German U-boat wolf packs sank ships with impunity in what they called the American Shooty Season. In 10 days, five U-boats sank 25 ships with a out a single U-boat sunk or damaged. U.S. shipping losses skyrocketed throughout the first port of 1942. More and more U-boats appeared in the waters off the western Atlantic. At one point, 105 U-boats were patrolling the U.S. coast, sinking 524 ships along with 8 million tons of shipping. Increased patrols in the U.S. Navy's 10th Fleet managed to strike back against the U-boats. Given the mission of finding, tracking, and destroying German Sudge, the fleet sank 65 in late 1943 and early 1944. It eventually sank more than 100. Eventually, the German high command judged losses in the western Atlantic too high and pulled remaining U-boats from the area and reassigned them to the North Atlantic. Japanese internment. As a result of this and fear of the Japanese doing the same thing on the west coast and of the um, per attack on Pearl Harbor, the government issued or the president issued executive order 9066 which said that basically as commander-in-chief of the army and navy he could um, from time to time designate any area as a military installation and then exclude people from that area as a matter of national security um, then he gave the civilian exclusion order uh, number 33 which issued war relocation authority and evacuees on the west coast the entire West Coast was deemed a military installation, basically. And evacuees can only take their essentials, basically a suitcase. Um, and these were all people of Japanese American descent. This is the general, General John DeWitt, who was responsible for forcing 115,000 people of Japanese ancestry to relocation camps that were all up and down the West Coast, but also here in Idaho and all the way into Utah, and the most famous which is Manzanar, which is on the eastern slope of the Sierra. Um, many of you might have read Farewell to Manzanar. Here's some images. That is actually Manzanar, um, pretty brutal place to be in the winter and in the summer, super hot in the summer, super cool in the winter. Um, very few photos were taken of actual guards and guard towers as the government wouldn't allow it, but it was actually guarded. They were living in barracks, um, surrounded by barbed wire, and they could not leave. 